think that the, the secret here is not creating, I'm, I'm absolutely 100% with you, that community businesses, we shouldn't be trying to create, um, we shouldn't be trying to create new ones. We should be taking things that already exist and finding ways of being able to convert them into community businesses. We've, we had this, uh, we had this um, thing where all our cooperatives were turned into, into um, businesses and privatised. We just need to go back the other way. And <laughs> particularly for, uh, for our major infrastructure like our waterworks and uh, electricity companies and so forth. This is really the right way to go. Trying to do it by building up a new paradigm, if you like. It's going to be too slow. We, we can't afford to do that. We've got to, we've got to go much more quickly than, than that in order to be able to make a big difference and solve the, solve the problem. But, sorry, that was a statement, not a question. <laughs> Again, I, know, I agree with you, obviously. Ahmed, I'm not sure when you tuned in. On, uh, if you've got any questions, happy to answer them. And hi, Sam. We've almost finished both Kevin and myself. Uh, so yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry, I got caught up. <laughs> yeah. So we've recorded them though. So um, uh, they hopefully will be out um, sometime, rather. Yes. Ahmed, we can't hear you. You're not muted, but we can't hear you. This happened with your speech last night, yesterday afternoon, Hamid. Yeah, no, cannot hear. Very strange, isn't it? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, oh. uh, yes I, uh, regarding the community ownership, I wondered if the legal procedures are clear or wh what are the obstacles that normally the communities may face in setting up community owned uh, businesses? It uh, really depends. Yes, there are obstacles. Um, and so employee ownership in Australia it, is um, difficult. Um, we are starting to see employee ownership trust legislation come into Australia, which aims at making it easier. Um, I've just recently spoken with some UK people who've had employee ownership trusts for this purpose for a few more years. And, um, you know, they're better than nothing, but some nefarious examples have already happened where uh, the outgoing owners have sold to the employees uh, and through um, adverse circumstances, the employees have then defaulted and the previous owners have now re retained the assets, having as a profit, probably. Sorry, as, as a profit. Yeah, yeah. So they're buying back their own business for cents in the dollar after the employees have uh, been stung. <coughs> I mean, it, it's not perfect employee ownership transfers in the UK, and we're getting fairly excited about them here in Australia because. We don't have employee ownership trusts and our uh, employee share offer programs are really punitive and, um, and designed to be something like an incentive program for early employees of high tech businesses, not for uh, use in, in, in buying out. The other group customers uh, and community that they're not necessarily challenged legally so much as um, bringing together enough momentum and stakeholders and clarity to form the cooperative or the corporation that can then do the transaction uh, with reference to the underlying community well enough to get that off the line. So it's not prohibitive in terms of legal structures, instruments to use. They're all pretty standard. Most of your transactional lawyers, uh, mergers and acquisitions people will be able to do the legal documentation for a community or customers or 
uh, a group of people to get together to, to buy out the business. What they generally lack is the coordination and the personal relationships and the network to pull that to conversation together. Yeah. And to set up a community owned business from the, from the start, from, from the scratch, um, is, uh, is this again um, too difficult or what are the obstacles? Well, the thesis that I run is that, you know, 80% of um, all small businesses don't get past 12 months and, and something like 95% don't get past five years. Now, just because a community owns it, I don't think those statistics will uh, vary significantly. Like they'll, they'll be better, you would hope. But the reason that those failures happen is this one, three, nine ratio. So you've got to get to prototype, if you called all the effort and money to get to a prototype one, you need three to get to product market fit and you need nine in order to get distribution and scale. And so what happens in a community is you think that once you've got it to work or as a founder, uh, inventor type founder or an original proposition, you think once it, uh, conceptually works and you've built the mousetrap once, that's the main investment that's required. Actually, it's about one thirteenth of the investment that is required. And you've got a heap of, and you've got a heap of uh, likelihood of failure. And this is why, you know, the portfolio approach that venture capitalists make is that they're going to be paying with a winner for all the costs of all the losing bets that they've made which is why they look for unicorns and it's why they bug the markets to make those things because no singular deal is in isolation for them when they're dealing with a portfolio. When you're a community, your odds are still stacked against you for an early stage idea in an early stage business. And most communities won't, um, won't have that experimental portfolio mindset and it could be really detrimental to community wealth building to start a business at a community level that's almost statistically bound to fail. My suggestion or the thesis that I've put forward is that the community is better off uh, investing in businesses locally or as employees in the businesses they work in or as uh, customers with the businesses that they buy from that are mature and are facing the problem that their founders and early stage investors won't get a trade sale for whatever reason, are big enough to do an IPO. And so an exit to community becomes a compelling proposition for a whole suite of those mature businesses with exiting founders needing an exit. Uh, and that community wealth building would be better served with those de-risked businesses than with serving or exclusively focused on starting up new ventures in new spaces in an undercapitalized way where they don't have the right risk appetite. So if you're gonna start new businesses, also buy some older mature businesses, you know. Mm. But look, um, is, that doesn't seem to be, well, what little I know, it doesn't seem to be the case for community solar type uh, enterprises, maybe they're not the businesses that you're considering, but um, they do seem to start up and there's a bunch of successful ones. Yeah, the, um, um, uh, that's the business that we've, we've started. Um, and although we're still in prototyping stage, um, uh, the, the reason why that's the case with, is because they're extremely profitable. I mean, they, you you can't you, you simply can't go wrong with putting panels on your roof as a, as an individual, and you certainly can't shouldn't go wrong if you if you join together as a group to uh, put panels on your on your roofs. Uh, that's because it's because it's highly profitable, but you shouldn't also go wrong with uh, with housing either, uh, existing housing. So, um, what um, in in the talk that I gave, I discussed, um, maybe maybe you could describe it, um, um, and, uh, Andrew, Morty, 
Well, I will, but I'll go back to Sam's first talk about the success of renewable energy community owned businesses. Hard to say that it's a success yet because a lot of them are so early, right? Um, and uh, some people I've spoken with are imagining a society with 700% renewable energy rather than 100% renewable energy. And in that case, as energy becomes free, in fact, the reason that the uh, Shire in Victoria that we're talking to that wants to go to 700% net renewables is so that they can offer businesses in manufacturing, et cetera, free energy if they move their manufacturing plant from somewhere else to somewhere else. Because they can capture an abundance of wind and solar energy, they're not just trying to replace what they get from the grid, they're trying to create an attraction to their community by giving them shit tons of free renewable energy. Now in that market, and I'm not suggesting that that has scaled either, <laughs> in that market, your renewable energy uh, uh, cooperative or community owned uh, enterprise, when your local government is, is churning out way more uh, renewables than you as a collective of households, you're not guaranteed not to be eaten by your own local government doing something in renewables. It, and I don't know that it is de-risked after where, you know, and it currently does have high margins to, 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 to that point. Um, and Kevin, in terms of housing, yes, I mean, your suggestion there is that housing that's already owned by either the local or the state government could be transferred in ownership through tenure where the people are paying their rent in all, and a portion of their payment of the rent, I think you said 50%, would be buying them future ability to uh, maintain in that household. Yeah. And that paying out the investors who originally had to retrofit the old public housing and turn it into this kind of cooperative housing style. Mm -hmm. So there's like, um, a transfer of ownership that you could do through housing. Uh, if Sorry, the I didn't understand. <laughs> Sorry, that was that was my stupid Google thing. <laughs> oh, Siri. Oh, cool. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. So the um, yeah. So so the idea with uh, with the um, with uh, with my talk was about um, was about taking existing. Um, businesses that are now already essentially community businesses. So um, things like housing can be community businesses. Not, and I, I don't see social housing as the main market. I see, um, I see all these people who have invested in housing to get a, a return on investment. They've thought of housing as an investment, but it's a lousy investment for them. You know, it's only it's only viable if because of the tax breaks and because the the inflation has been allowed to run rampant. But as soon as that stops, and it will stop, um, uh, they're in trouble. They're in, they're in a lot of trouble. So uh, I see that um, that by making it so that each individual who occupies the house does get ownership of the house through their occupation um, and use of the abuse of the asset and having a community asset as opposed to individual assets, you save uh, immense amounts of money associated with the whole financial system. So. Do we have still time for some more questions or? Yes, plenty of time. Yeah, I wondered if there are any um, activism in Australia <coughs> going on to promote uh, policies that would favor uh, cooperative housing or community wealth building by, by talking to the political parties or influencing the legislations at the state or the federal level? Yeah, we've, uh, in, the ACT has just elected a Greens Labor coalition government. The Greens have 30% um, and of the ministerial positions. Um, uh, Labor is also coming along with with most of the most of the policies. 
Uh, so we've got a good chance here if we can put up good proposals. So, um, so and I also have a, a policy of trying to engage the communities in different things. And so um, there are a few of us trying to get um, um, both those things together. You, you get engagement of the community if you can give the community ownership um, of the different things. Um, uh, so I think we've got a, we've got a, a reasonable chance of getting things through. Um, the ones that are of particular interest to me at the moment are community batteries. Um, the ACT does have 100% renewable electricity now. Um, it's going to need a lot more electricity because it is phasing out its gas, and, and that turns out to be about 50% of our energy consumption. Uh, and particularly because we have very high costs over winter time <clears throat> and most of that is gas at the moment. So we've got a great opportunity of being able to get um, uh, community ownership um, here if we, can, if we can get our act together. The, um, the difficulty as I was pointing out to Andrew at the moment is, is finance. It's always the problem. And the difficulty with finance for community organisations is that um, the, the lenders require asset backing. And asset backing tends to have to be in real estate or the equivalent. They don't, they don't, um, if you don't have a, a, an ongoing business, they don't treat ongoing income as, as, equity or as this is the equivalent of equity. So that's just a, a they, they, they can overcome it simply by their internal, internal um, uh, rules, uh, but the, and so we, we need to find some, um, some people who, uh, some organizations that are willing to actually have a go at doing this. So um, yeah, so that's, that's where we're at. I've got another question. Um, I think it's to Andrew, um, but uh, it's a, a different area. Um, I, I've done a lot of work with the management training for indigenous groups and organizations. Um, and I know there was a, a very large uh, failure rate, but I, um, th those um, percentages you mentioned, Andrew, I think it was similar. It wasn't worse than that. Um, so ha have you had much experience with Indigenous RUM, Indigenous community-based, that sort of thing? N no, I haven't. Um, the, the, there's an interesting... Uh, no, I haven't is the short answer. My experience is that the Indigenous foods organisations are looking very, uh, like currently investigating platform cooperativism. So how all of these indigenous food-based uh, businesses around Australia can work together democratically and- uh, Just by the way, you know that only 1% of indigenous food is Aboriginal owned. That's why uh, this is uh, being kind of catalyzed, if you want, by the uh, Indigenous Land and Sea Corporation with the express idea of giving those actually Indigenous uh, businesses the strength through aggregation that comes of branding and being able to have a marketplace mechanism that on their own isn't enough to face up to their well-funded corporate kakadu plums by um, by um, the big food company here, like like Mars now owns <laughs> Kakadu, right? <laughs> um, so you you kind of want to get indigenous ownership of indigenous bu bush foods, and what's really exciting is that they seem to be coming together around platform cooperativism, and I've got an involvement in that, but I haven't got. Uh, I haven't done anything with in, Indigenous organisations to date. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, I think that's... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, after you, Kev, go. 
Um, I think the, 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 the idea of platform cooperatives is really important in this area because most of the things that you need to do for uh, cooperatives, and you want cooperatives not to be too big because otherwise they just become companies, um, the, uh, most of the things that they need to do can be, can be done by platform cooperatives. Um, so that's the way to scale the thing is to, is to get um, the services that you need, including the financial services that you need, to be able to be um, routinized so that they, they just buy them as a, as a, uh, from service providers who hopefully are cooperatives themselves. Um, so, yeah. Because I can talk at uh, length about this, but maybe there are other things to go on about here. No, no, go ahead. Well, um, in, in Kevin, you, from Kevin and I are both in the Sydney Commons Lab, and um, uh, one interesting thing that's happening there is um, uh, we've been in contact with the Black Duck Company, which is the um, um, Bruce Pascoe-related. Um, community, I think it's a co-op, I'm, I'm not really sure what its structure is, but it, it's offering Indigenous groups around the country, which it seems to me that, that they'll be swamped when this offer comes out, is, is about um, um, native um, grasses and tubers, like uh, which of course are based on the local ecosystems and not the same species everywhere in the country by a long way. Now, Run. But anyway, they're offering to sort of support uh, Aboriginal groups who want to get into, who have got maybe land and uh, could then maybe um, scale up with some of this uh, native grasses, which be, which were used in the past, as, as Bruce Pascoe pointed out in Deep Emu, uh, Dark Emu. Um, um, so it's a really interesting, exciting, very... Um, uh, pro-Aboriginal or Aboriginal-focused uh, um, uh, possibilities, but but obviously things like finance and all those other issues that um, you've talked about, um, I, I, I get the impression you've talked about here, um, um, are going to also be important things for them to um, uh, get on top of sooner or later. You know? I, I would imagine you're right. Um... Yeah, I agree. Uh, I, I hadn't heard of the land and sea, so I, th I thought that was just a North Australian um, uh, organisation. ILSC, I think, is um, Indigenous Land and Sea Corporation, a standalone thing. It's, the, um, you know, it, it's about promoting, I think, 40% of Australia's land mass is still Indigenous lands. Yep, yep. Uh, about similar amount of coastline is indigenous coastline, uh, like indigenous owned coastline, the fishing and the um, seafoods and things. They're actually, you know, 40, big picture, times, great. 40 times bigger than the AA company, the Australian Agriculture Company, but we don't recognize how good and how big uh, they are collectively as uh, a food provider processor. Uh, I mean, we we could have a globally competitive native grains business, like uh, Bruce is suggesting, to compete with the European grains and the Asian grains that we're currently growing here. Uh, and you know, uh, that would be a wonderful thing to to see catalyzed. But um. There is that other organisation, the, the one that um, I forgot what it's called. It around the um, the burning, the the and other ways. Of... Fire sticks. Well, well, fire sticks is the one about the the indigenous knowledge about burning. But no, there's a organisation that, um, um, uh, like I say, I forgot what it's called. But it 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 brokers. Um, it's Aboriginal run and the brokers, um, like uh, one example, Sydney Uni uh, wants to look good with its um, uh, zero carbon. They, they will buy um, some carbon credit uh, from some savannah part of North Australia and, 
and yep. it, 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 that's it, 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 that's the main thing it does, but it's moving into other ways of um, enriching soil but through carbon, and and which again is uh, relates to the uh, native grains. Um, it has uh, lots of good ecological effects as well as possible economic effects. Um, but but, but uh, again, it's it's an Aboriginal-owned um, um, operation that operates in in the the marketplace in in the, in the mainstream marketplace. Yeah, uh, that's Aboriginal Carbon Fund, ABC Fund, with Rowan yeah. Foley. Very, in, uh, very inspiring and, and uh, good organisation. Yeah, uh, love to see more of that. Um, um, I'm just wondering, um, particularly Sam's here, look, one of the things in the thing that I was presenting was the idea of moving away from um, individual ownership to collective ownership and and towards custodialship of things. I'd just like to get your thoughts on how, how you see that. Um, so I'll just, if you don't mind, I'll just share a little bit of the video. If that, is that okay? Uh, not the video, the... the um, do I share? There we are, this one here. Um, can you see the screen? Yep. Um, so, so what we're um, what we're doing is um, is instead of instead of an asset, say like a house or a set of houses being owned by um, individuals, um, the assets the, all the assets are owned by the local community whatever that local community might be. <clears throat> but individuals have custodialship over part of the, uh, of the, over the house in which they live. So what you do is you, is you, is you have group ownership, literally, it's the titles in, in the name of the group, but the individuals who live in the places have custodialship over the, over the uh, place in which they live. So that means that they get, um, they have to look after it, but they also get the benefit of living in it. And they pay rent? They pay rent. Yes, they pay rent. Um, but, uh, and there are various things, other things associated with that. But on the rental side of things, um, uh, here, whoops, oh, wait, sorry, I went, went the wrong direction. How do I go back again? Back. Nah, sorry about that. So, um, so individuals have uh, custodialship over the place in which they live. When they, when they pay rent, then 50% of the money that they pay um, goes towards future rent. In other words, they can use 50% like of, the, of, the, of the money that they pay now goes towards paying their rent in the future. So when they have bought the house effectively or at some stage that whatever the community decides, the, um, the, the, the money that they, or well, 50% of the money that they've paid in rent, they can now use to pay for future rent. So that gives them security of tenure because they actually own that future rent. So you, <clears throat> you, you, you solve the problem of, of tenure by, by giving people a different form of capital. And the capital is not, is not ownership of an asset, but it's on the ownership of, the, of, of a particular asset. 
Does that make sense? Here we are. So in a financial, in a financial economy, capital is assets that produce income. So you own the asset, you get the income. In a regulated commons economy, which is an Eleanor Rostrom's type economy, capital is the right to pay for goods and services. Sounds, sounds a terrific idea. Um, I, I, I've got, we, we were talking about an Aboriginal um, situation, Kevin. There's a long and not very um, a promising history of Aboriginal housing. I, I don't know if, you, if you're aware of this. Yes. Um, so I was just wondering whether this fits in to that concept of, of, of custodialship. Uh, well, I, I think, uh, well, it, it, it sounds right but uh, to me, but um, uh, having had um, indirect um, evidence of some of the th ways things stuff up really badly in Aboriginal housing, there's a range of different, yeah, and probably one part of the problem is that it's done through government services, the, the Aboriginal housing um, programs. Mm -hmm. And even if it's owned by the local land council, there are problems. Um, so what, I, I think there are problems that could be fixed. Um, so what are the sort of problems that they have? Uh, people stop paying rent. Um, oh. And, and, and the, uh, the so-called owner, whether it's the, uh, the, a government agency or the land council hasn't got the money to fix, to maintain the properties. Right. And, and often that starts with the, the properties <coughs> not appropriate anyway. The, 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 yeah, they're the classic one of, um, yeah, it was sort of small, yeah, one family houses when Aboriginal families are big families, you know. Yeah. There's, there's a range of problems. That, uh, yeah. So, so the re in, these, in these regulated commons, the um, the people who pay rent, they pay not a fixed rent, but they pay a rent according to their income. That, that, that would help, but, but, but as long as there's enough money generated to maintain the property, one way or, or another. Effectively, that's what you've got to do. You've got to have them enough money to maintain to maintain the houses is what you need. Now, if you, if you, keep, if you keep the money inside the, inside, the, inside the commons, then that removes a lot of the need to take money out and then put money back in again in the way in which we normally do financing of things. Uh, yeah, I, I just want to say that um, I, I was looking at worst, <coughs> worst case scenarios there are some scenarios where Aboriginal run housing works really well. Mm -hmm. um, often that depends on leadership um, and, and, um, uh, and when leadership changes, it can, it can go bad. Yeah. Um, but, but anyway, uh, um, I, I think it's well worth um, investigating um, a, a, a different way of, of um, this sort of um, uh, financing and, and um, um, and and uh, <coughs> excuse me, I, I think when you uh, uh, the work I've done many years with Aboriginal groups, um, they they um, even if they're run by one person, a company or something, they're all very community minded. You know, they 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 um, sometimes they get badly burnt, and and one or two or, or let's say a family looks after a company or even a housing co-op. Um, they they still have this community mindedness, um, uh, a sort of um, a cultural obligation, basically, and that still um, is there. So I think that's a good basis for what you talked about that that um, the um, custodial sort of relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, no, I think I need to go. You guys are welcome to stay. Um, and just end it when you're ready. Oh, but, um, sorry. I've got to start the next one in yeah. five minutes. Um, I think we're finished anyway. So um, thanks for uh, thanks for everything, Morty. Kevin. And Kevin, maybe we can talk further because I've got a few contacts there from my students uh, in Canberra, the... the Matilda House and Paul House, so you probably come across them. Okay, 
Right, and and maybe talk about. Yeah, um, yeah. I'll be talking. Talk I'll be talking just more to the city, the Commons people. Yep. Okay. And I'd very much like to have a chat to you, Hamid, if I could. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.